and welcome to uh, UTITE's weekly seminar. Um, I am Mahia, the Vice President of the club, and in today's seminar, uh, Dr. Joseph Chow um, will be doing a presentation on the topic of uh, micro transit develop, uh, deployment, uh, portfolio management using simulation based data upscaling. Um, Dr. Chow is an Institute Associate Professor at NYU Tandon School of Engineering's uh, Civil and Urban Engineering Department with affiliations with CUSP and Rudin Center for Transportation Policy and Management. Uh, and with that, uh, Dr. Chow, please, uh, the floor is all yours. Thanks, Maya. Uh, so, yeah, I'm uh, delighted to be here today. Uh, I, as I mentioned to me, I, I used to uh, frequent uh, these uh, weekly seminars when I was teaching at Ryerson. So it's nice to be uh, back uh, here, at least virtually, to uh, share some of our research uh, with the students and uh, faculty there. Uh, so yeah, this is work that uh, is uh, joined with my uh, three of my PhD students uh, listed here. And I believe Shusti is actually in, in the audience too. So uh, Shusti Rath, uh, Bing Ting Lu, and uh, Kyukun Yoon. Uh, this was a project that we did for the C2 Smart Center in the last year, uh, pretty much wrapped up and uh, we've, uh, it, it, the work's not published yet. Uh, we, uh, we're just uh, uh, kind of uh, having it under review right now. Um, and this is a work that was uh, in collaboration with uh, VIA Transportation. Uh, they shared some data with us to, to conduct the study. Uh, so, events, yeah. Okay, so uh, to uh, start off with, uh, just to, so that we're all on the same page, uh, I define microtransit here. Um, so using uh, a common definition from uh, Walensky, uh, so we're defining microtransit as any shared public or private sector transportation services uh, that offer fixed or dynamically allocated routes and schedules in response to individual and aggregate consumer demand using smaller vehicles. Uh, widespread mobile GPS and internet connectivity. Uh, in our case, uh, for our uh, uh, case study using VIA's data, uh, we're, we're trying to mimic their operation. So we're looking at on-demand vans that uh, pick up and drop off people at virtual stops based on real-time requests with a dedicated service region uh, where uh, the, the fleet doesn't really depart from that service region. Okay. So the motivation for this study uh, is, uh, uh, comes from uh, uh, this, uh, we, we can show this slide as an illustration. So uh, the, uh, one of the questions that VIA has and, and many other, uh, these uh, private uh, micro mobility, uh, micro transit providers, uh, they, uh, they're looking at deploying to different cities, right? So VIA here uh, uh, has a couple of dozen uh, deployments in the U.S. alone, uh, and uh, many more in other cities around the world. Uh, and so for them, the question is, uh, where should they, uh, what other places should they uh, deploy in? What kind of service uh, designs should they consider? Uh, service regions, uh, what kind of policy should they operate? Um, and what this uh, suggests to us is that there is this uh, paradigm shift that's occurring in transportation planning. Uh, where traditionally we've seen uh, tra transportation planning used primarily in a more city or region centric approach, right? Where public agencies or the drivers, uh, they, uh, they have uh, detailed traveler uh, uh, surveys conducted uh, to try to uh, better understand their, their population uh, and uh, to then uh, plan around that uh, over, uh, over the years, right? Uh, what we're seeing now is a more uh, operator-centric uh, planning perspective where there are uh, these operators that are considering multiple cities or regions to deploy to. And, and it's, it's really a collaborative effort between these private operators uh, as well as public agencies at, the, at each of those local regions to uh, come together to, uh, to uh, de determine where, you know, where to deploy uh, these, uh, these services. Uh, the difference in, in terms of the data is, uh, is a big, uh, is a very crucial point because in the uh, cities uh, region centric, uh, we, we assume that there's uh, 
very well collected travel survey uh, information. Uh, Toronto, for example, has a, a very robust uh, travel survey uh, program um, uh, operated by uh, U of T folks, in fact. Um, but uh, with these multi, uh, these operator-centric planning approaches, uh, the operators tend to have to uh, plan for multiple cities. And so they might not have the luxury of uh, having uh, detailed traveler surveys across multiple cities. Uh, what they do have is very detailed mobility data for their user base uh, within this limited sample of cities that they do have operations in, right? Uh, so uh, the motivation here is uh, we're, we're trying to accommodate this uh, shift uh, towards a more operator-centric planning perspective uh, to uh, try to see if we can uh, help uh, uh, develop uh, uh, transportation planning tools uh, within that context. All right. Uh, and and this, this is more important than ever, uh, especially uh, during this time with uh, a lot of emerging uh, transportation uh, technologies and operating policies. Uh, there's also, it comes with, uh, along with that, uh, you, we also see a lot of uh, failures, right? Uh, so the selection of service regions, uh, the selection of the specific operating policy uh, can make or break a service. Right? I like to share this particular slide with uh, the students in my classes uh, uh, and framing it as kind of like a, a transportation graveyard, right? uh, failed, uh, failed projects uh, that have uh, um, taken place. Um, and so, uh, uh, not not necessarily because uh, they would, didn't provide great service, uh, but uh, there could have been other various reasons uh, for uh, the service uh, not working out. Uh, but uh, these uh, uh, these kind of uh, operational uh, incidents uh, 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 give us uh, strong motivation to really uh, provide uh, better uh, decision support tools to uh, to these uh, operators and public agencies. So when we think about this. Uh, uh, operator-centric approach of uh, planning for deployments across different cities uh, around the country, around the world. Uh, some of the research questions uh, that we wish to answer, uh, if assuming we had the data available, uh, could include, uh, for example, which cities would benefit more from having uh, microtransit operations and by how much, right? Um, so on the, uh, on the right-hand side, uh, you see that uh, there's two different examples of uh, uh, two different portfolios uh, of uh, city deployments. Uh, uh, one uh, showing uh, four cities, uh, uh, Sacramento, Cupertino, Salt Lake, and Austin. And then uh, another four cities uh, uh, in uh, a separate portfolio. So how do we actually compare one portfolio to another portfolio? Uh, how, how can we determine uh, how well the microtransit operations would work in each of those cases? Right. Uh, and, and it's looking at uh, not uh, in terms of uh, the congestion reduction, uh, uh, equitable access, greenhouse gas emission reductions, uh, various uh, performance metrics that uh, we might be interested in. Uh, along with that, we are also uh, interested in how the deployments might be impacted by different operating policies of the microtransit provider. Right. Uh, these uh, because uh, they might uh, change the policy from one city to another. Uh, they might change the, the parameters for virtual stop distances. They might have different fare pricing uh, policies. They might have different uh, idle vehicle repositioning policies. Uh, and we want to be able to quantify the impacts uh, of these portfolios for the different cities. Uh, and uh, related to this for public trans, uh, for the public agencies, uh, they're often very interested in how the, uh, these microtransit services would play a role as a first or last mile connector within the uh, multimodal system, right? Uh, because um, historically studies have shown that microtransit uh, operations uh, tend to uh, uh, operate uh, uh, at lower costs uh, under a, a lower um, a, a, a demand ridership uh, uh, ser service regions, right? So like uh, when there's a lower de density, they, they would operate at lower cost than, uh, than um, uh, the fixed route transit service, uh, services. Uh, so in this case, uh, is it possible to, to forecast what percent of the ridership ends up taking microtransit as a first or last mile connector as opposed to using it as a direct trip, right? So these kind of questions that uh, we wanna be able to answer. Uh, the problem is that the data that we tend to have, uh, even in the uh, previous uh, slide where I showed you VIA's 
uh, operations in the U.S. They have 36 city uh, uh, cities as, uh, um, as as the samples uh, from which they can uh, use to uh, develop forecast models uh, across uh, uh, many more cities. Right, so it's it's a challenge uh, because we have very limited data, uh, and so uh, the existing deployments are limited. And when we think about the potential market, right, the total addressable market, uh, just uh, in the U.S. alone, and uh, uh, I, I would say in, in Canada, there's a, a similar uh, uh, scale of this kind of potential marketplace. Uh, in the U.S., there are over 3,000 cities with populations with 10,000 or more uh, people uh, and 300 or more uh, cities with uh, populations of 100,000 or more. Uh, and so looking at just 36 observations, it's often insufficient to really provide a robust forecast model uh, to uh, plan for uh, the deployment in those other cities. Okay, uh, and, and much less for uh, targeted uh, population segments. If, uh, for, for example, you want to focus on equity and uh, uh, serving underserved communities. So our concept here is to make use of simulation to upscale the scenario data. Um, so here uh, on the left-hand side, I provide an illustration of uh, what upscaling uh, means, where you might start with a poor quality image and you use algorithms to improve the quality of the image, uh, uh, basically uh, synthesizing uh, the uh, a higher quality image using, uh, using algorithms. And we do that uh, Similarly, for uh, transportation planning, right, for uh, developing uh, scenarios uh, for for these kind of forecast models that uh, that we wish to employ, right. So we can uh, use available data for ridership, vehicle utilization, uh, public data where available, uh, uh, use that to inform a market equilibrium simulator, uh, so that we can output uh, more detailed performance measures in terms of degree of first last mile access, fleet size, journey times, and so on and so forth. Right. Uh, so uh, that's the scope of this project. Uh, so in uh, designing this uh, methodology, uh, we, uh, we saw this uh, as a, uh, a, within this framework. So if we take a look at the top uh, uh, dashed bracket, right? Uh, this this is what we want to achieve. Uh, we want to be able to have a forecast model where we can take public data for any city uh, and be able to forecast uh, me measures like ridership, fleet VMT, right? v vehicle miles traveled or vehicle kilometers traveled, right? Um, but the the challenge is that we have limited data for for this forecast model, right? Uh, so uh, to help with that, uh, we have a another uh, uh, portion uh, process where we uh, develop a, a market equilibrium model for a select number of cities where we do have detailed data for uh, using uh, 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 data that's publicly available as well as uh, the micro transits uh, services uh, available data like ridership and occupancy. Um, and, and then using that equilibrium model uh, for those various cities to then generate a much larger number of scenarios, right? So that we can use uh, that scenario generator to then provide uh, input variables for the forecast model. Okay, so that's the premise of this uh, this work. Uh, then in developing uh, this process, we need to make sure that the demand model uh, needs to be aggregate uh, because we're assuming that only public data across multiple cities are available uh, and uh, they're only available at uh, aggregate level. And so we don't really have uh, detailed uh, travel surveys of uh, travelers across different cities uh, with uh, micro transit uh, as a mode of preference. Uh, so it's, it's very limited uh, uh, data uh, from which we uh, have to estimate demand model. Um, but we still need to estimate a demand model that accounts for two different population segments. Uh, one. Uh, referring to travelers making direct trips within a well-defined service region, uh, and also a population of travelers that might be making a trip using uh, microtransit to uh, get to a transit station from which they can access uh, a greater region as a first last mile access. Uh, we also need our market equilibrium model to uh, be able to 
handle dynamic on-demand transit service design, right? So it needs to be sensitive to various uh, dispatch routing uh, uh, repositioning policies. Uh, it needs to account for observed occupancy data from uh, the micro transit operator. Uh, it, uh, and we want to be able to calibrate uh, the parameters uh, for, for this uh, micro, uh, for this uh, market equilibrium simulator, right? So uh, pedestrian access distance, maximum wait time, detour time uh, uh, can be uh, calibrated per, per city. Uh, and, and we want to efficiently construct uh, independent uh, scenarios uh, based on all of this. All right, so to address that, we start out with a market equilibrium model uh, that was uh, developed uh, earlier uh, when, uh, in fact, from my days at Ryerson, uh, working with Shadi Javadian, uh, where uh, we uh, look at a day-to-day -day, uh, adjustment process. Uh, we have simulated traveler agents. We have a simulated micro transit fleet. Uh, within each day, we simulate the, the service uh, of the micro transit for the travelers. Uh, and then on a day-to-day -day basis, there is an adjustment for both the travelers as well as the, the transit, uh, the micro transit fleet, right? So for the travelers, they might adjust the mode choice. Uh, they might adjust their departure times. Uh, for the uh, micro transit fleet, they'll adjust their fleet size uh, uh, or uh, various other policies uh, that uh, are deemed uh, adjustable at a tactical level. Uh, an example of uh, that, uh, day-to-day -day adjustment process was illustrated in uh, another paper that we had done. Uh, we, sh we showed that uh, for a simple uh, network example, uh, we uh, using the day-to-day -day adjustment, it converges to the same uh, classic uh, stochastic user equilibrium assignment when the uh, generated number of populations uh, uh, increase to high numbers. Okay. So, this day-to-day uh, -day adjustment process is used uh, as the core uh, uh, equilibrium, uh, like market equilibrium model. Uh, there's a mode choice model that we need to consider. Uh, there's a within day micro transit simulator uh, and, and then the day-to-day -day adjustment itself. Um, <clears throat> for the uh, mode choice uh, model, as I mentioned, we needed a, an aggregate model. So all we can estimate is an aggregate mode choice model for each city. Um, so uh, this aggregate mode choice model, uh, because of that uh, limitation, uh, we make use of uh, uh, like a simple uh, uh, multinomial logic model. Uh, that's, uh, and, and we estimate uh, one for, uh, based on uh, assuming that there's uh, direct trips as well as uh, considering uh, users that might be making trips for first and last mile. So we consider the OD demands for both types of trips. Um, because the micro transit operations uh, are not available, uh, uh, integrated with the public data, right? So we had to first estimate the uh, a public um, aggregate mode choice model uh, separate from the micro transit. Uh, so it, uh, not including the micro transit. So here I show some of the utility functions that we use. Uh, leaving out the micro transit, uh, we can estimate that for those uh, public uh, for those cities with the public data, right? Um, and, and then for the uh, micro transit, we can then add that on uh, and uh, estimate uh, the, uh, for example, uh, the, uh, the micro transit we added on and assume some of the, uh, these parameters are similar to some of the other modes. And then we uh, calibrate the constant so that uh, it fits to the ridership data that we have uh, for those cities. Um, and this shows a, uh, uh, how the, the mode choice model uh, estimation and calibration uh, ends up uh, being done. Uh, uh, keep in mind that there is one, one level of feedback. So uh, the uh, estimated demand models that we have, we then use that to uh, run through the uh, the day-to-day the -day adjustment process. Uh, and at the end of that process, we uh, uh, feedback the, uh, the performance measures uh, to re-estimate the demand models. Uh, for the within day simulator, uh, we, we make use of an open source tool that we developed for the Federal Transit Administration. Uh, this was a project we had done for them uh, back in 2020. Uh, and uh, this simulator allows us to run simulations uh, of uh, a range of different types of transit operations from fixed route transit 
uh, to flexible route to on-demand uh, transit op uh, operations. So we took the on-demand transit operations uh, and used that uh, for, for this uh, exercise. Uh, so in this case, we also have to make modifications to that tool uh, so that uh, it can be used uh, for, uh, for these different cities uh, that we're looking at. Uh, these are the six cities where VIA was able to provide data for. Uh, they, they had to make a request to each of the cities uh, to uh, have approval from the cities to share that data with us. Um, and so we, we modified the simulator so that some of the parameters are tunable. So uh, 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 parameters like uh, the, 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 the uh, dwell time, the walk speed, uh, uh, the, the maximum detour wait time, uh, the walking limit for passengers uh, uh, when considering uh, virtual stops, uh, those are parameters that can be modified from city to city. Okay. So, uh, and, and this shows uh, the uh, inputs for this uh, within day simulator. Uh, as you can see, uh, there's uh, uh, general simulation parameters, there's scenario specific parameters, uh, there's a system design parameters, uh, and there's uh, the data that we need to uh, input into this. Uh, so that's all uh, within uh, this uh, within day simulator. So uh, once we have all that, we can then uh, calibrate uh, this, uh, the, this market equilibrium model that we have uh, for uh, six different cities. So we have different uh, market equilibrium models for um, each of these cities uh, using VIA data. Uh, for the data collection, uh, we, we make use of uh, these publicly available data sources, uh, or all publicly available except for the VIA data, of course. Uh, and uh, these are uh, available and we make use of this to uh, determine uh, the, uh, uh, the mode choice, uh, the aggregate mode choice model, uh, uh, X minus the uh, microtransit. <clears throat> the uh, re resultant uh, parameters that we get are shown here. Uh, so this is basically the first step of that uh, estimation um, for each of the cities. Um, leaving out again the microtransit portion for now. Uh, note that uh, for some of the parameters, uh, we had to further simplify and make assumption that they're relative to other parameters uh, just because of the uh, uh, limitation of the data uh, that we have. Right? Um, but uh, yeah, th this is what we ended up with for the six different cities. Uh, on top of that, then we, uh, we then uh, took some of the parameters, we borrowed those, uh, and assumed that those were the same parameters for microtransit, uh, but the alternative specific constant was, was then modified uh, for microtransit. Uh, so this was done across the six cities using uh, least squares uh, with the ridership numbers, uh, and these were the parameters that we got for the alternative specific constant. Uh, and just as uh, uh, to, to uh, evaluate the goodness of fit of these, uh, this constant, uh, we saw that when the constant was set to zero, uh, this was the uh, absolute error. Uh, and then when we uh, changed it to uh, the uh, optimized uh, uh, constants, uh, the error was reduced significantly. Okay. Uh, we then uh, run this through the day-to-day -day adjustment process. Right? Uh, this, uh, and in this process, uh, we made use of 10 populations. Right? So there's 10 different simulations for each uh, city. Uh, and uh, these are uh, average uh, values that uh, we're seeing here. Uh, so uh, basically, the day-to-day -day adjustment would, uh, would uh, run until uh, there's uh, some uh, uh, convergence uh, through the uh, weighted averages. Okay, <clears throat> these are some of the values uh, we're able to output uh, perceived uh, in vehicle times, perceived walk times, uh, wait times, and so, so on and so forth. Um, and uh, so with, the, with this day-to-day uh, -day adjustment, uh, we now uh, calibrate uh, the day-to-day the, uh, -day adjustment and the uh, within-day simulators. Uh, so that uh, we can have as best of a fit as we can for the six different cities. Uh, you can see that uh, some of the parameters uh, do get, uh, they, they are different from city to city. Um, and uh, we ended up, uh, so we compared the ridership uh, uh, based on the uh, observed that we had for each of these six cities with the, uh, the output from the calibrated uh, market equilibrium models. And on average, it was about 18% 
uh, error, which uh, we felt was uh, adequate given uh, the limited data and the uh, six uh, city samples that we're dealing with. Okay. Uh, the interesting uh, thing is that now with this uh, estimated uh, uh, and calibrated market equilibrium models uh, for these uh, different cities, we can output other measures that are not observable, right? So we can see uh, the percent of the uh, users that are uh, using the microtransit as a direct trip versus as a uh, first or last mile access trip. Uh, and we also have measures like uh, in-vehicle time, wait time, and walk time. So uh, uh, the, the, these, the, 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 micro, uh, the market equilibrium model provides uh, very valuable uh, information in, in that sense. <clears throat> um, so having calibrated those, now we want to generate uh, a number of large number of scenarios and use that to fit uh, a forecast model for uh, outputting different performance measures. Right. Uh, in terms of the scenario generation, uh, we we wanted to make sure that uh, each scenario we generated uh, was independent, uh, but we also um, uh, made sure that uh, we we try to uh, diversify our uh, our sampling. Right. So uh, the way that we did this was for each of the six cities, uh, and in this case, we found that two of the cities. Had, were, were a little bit more outliers. So uh, Columbus uh, uh, operated very differently from the other uh, cities and uh, Jersey City actually operates with a very different pricing policy uh, uh, because of the way it's uh, operating uh, within the greater New York re region. So we left those two out. Uh, we used the other remaining four cities uh, to randomly uh, initiate uh, starting uh, zones. Uh, here, each zone is a census tract uh, from which we would grow out uh, a, a service region. Uh, and we made sure that um, we uh, sampled, uh, uh, we, we, we used clustering to, uh, uh, to make sure that we uh, selected a sample of uh, uh, service regions that were uh, well spread out. Um, so this is some illustration of the sample scenarios uh, with uh, synthetic data uh, uh, that uh, we, we have, right? Uh, so uh, four different examples where uh, some of these are basically uh, these values are outputs from the uh, market equilibrium model applied to these synthetic scenarios, okay? Uh, once we have uh, the, uh, the scenarios generated, we can then use linear regression. In this case, we did linear regression with first order interaction variables. Uh, so multiplying different variables together, uh, and selecting the uh, combination of those uh, using last re uh, regularization. Uh, and so the starting variables that we, uh, we use uh, were, were this, this set of uh, variables, uh, employment density, household density, mean income, street density, uh, transit station density, uh, uh, auto ownership, uh, trip equilibrium index, which indicated uh, the, the, how balanced uh, trips were uh, going back and forth for commutes. Uh, and microtransit pricing policy, which uh, we considered two different ones. One was uh, where uh, first and last mile trips uh, had to be paid separately, and one in which they were considered free uh, and kind of part of the uh, the fare bundle. <clears throat> um, in the scenario generation, we ended up generating 326 scenarios, uh, broken down as follows, uh, and uh, we estimated two different forecast models, one to predict uh, vehicle miles traveled and one to predict the ridership. Uh, so uh, these numbers uh, give you some sense of the differences that we had. Uh, overall, the, the training set uh, R squared uh, was a fairly good fit. Uh, and uh, in comparison, uh, so for the, uh, uh, for the evaluation of the models, we had to make sure we evaluate only compared to the original four data sets, right? Uh, the, the, the four uh, cities, because uh, the synthetic data is, is all synthesized. So in comparing to those four cities, we found that the uh, coefficient of variation was about 45 to 37%, which is a little high, but keep in mind that this is comparing to four different samples only for four cities. Uh, and uh, short of having the synthetic uh, a data set, um, we wouldn't even be able to come up with anything at all. So, so compared to that alternative, uh, this seemed like a pretty good 
um, uh, at least as a proof of concept in which we can further expand this to many more cities, uh, potentially even classifying cities into different city types and topologies so that we can uh, better fit these models uh, in the future. Okay, but uh, having this, what can we do with this? So one thing is uh, uh, the inference. Uh, so with forecast models, once we've selected our final set of uh, uh, the uh, features, uh, we we wanted to evaluate the, uh, the statistical significance and, and also uh, look at uh, how they can provide guidance on uh, deployment in different cities. Uh, so we took those variables since the uh, uh, since the, uh, the lasso uh, method doesn't really output uh, p-values, we took those parameters and uh, re-estimated re using OLS uh, to, just to get p-values uh, so we can do a comparison. Uh, for, the, for the ridership model, uh, these were some of the uh, variables that were statistically significant. There were also many first order variables uh, uh, that were uh, significant as well, uh, but uh, less interpretable. So uh, here I'm only showing the original variables among the 10 that we had. Uh, and the interesting thing we see here is that, um, for example, the transit density for ridership model uh, uh, shows a positive coefficient as well as uh, employment density, whereas they're both negative for the VMT model. Uh, so if we were to use this information in selecting other cities and service regions uh, in the future, uh, we can try to identify uh, cities and service regions where uh, uh, we want to have higher ridership, so we would try to have higher transit station densities and employment densities. Uh, which would also uh, uh, potentially lead to lower VMTs uh, for those uh, compared to other uh, zones that we might choose. Right. <clears throat> we also applied these two models then uh, to identifying uh, alternative portfolios. So starting with the original four cities that we had, right, uh, we, we know the, uh, the ridership and we uh, predict the VMT. Uh, for those uh, four cities. Uh, so then based on that, we can then uh, identify a candidate list of uh, various service regions uh, and cities, right? So this is one example. So we have a, a, a large list of uh, different cities and service region uh, deployments. Uh, and among those, uh, we can then make predictions of the ridership in VNT so that we can actually choose uh, an alternative portfolio. portfolio. Uh, here we have one where the VMT for this set of cities uh, under these designs uh, would is uh, is forecasted to have 1.4 times the ridership uh, of uh, the uh, original four cities that we had, uh, while maintaining a similar level of VMT. Uh, right, uh, and here is another portfolio design where uh, again the the total VMT for this portfolio uh, is is uh, very similar to that original four cities uh, uh, that we had data for, uh, but the ridership is forecasted to be 1.9 times. So, so this is one way where we can now uh, use uh, the forecast, the, the synthetic data to support a forecast model so that we can use a forecast model to make decision support for identifying new cities to, uh, to consider deployment. Of course, um, Again, uh, there, there needs to be uh, more expansion to uh, larger cities, a larger number of cities and uh, potentially fitting them to different types of cities uh, uh, as a next step. Uh, and, and also to, you know, uh, once you've identified uh, 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 potential cities to deploy in, you can go further and actually conduct more detailed analyses, right? So uh, some takeaways uh, from this, uh, let me just take a look. Okay, yeah. So what have we learned? Uh, we, we know that uh, from, from the study, it is possible to fit a simulation-based market equilibrium models to uh, different cities with uh, microtransit deployments. Uh, the portfolio forecast models uh, based on the upscale data show sufficient fit, even with only four city samples uh, to start with. Uh, under this emerging operator-centric planning paradigm uh, that we're seeing, uh, we can help identify new cities uh, and convince uh, them to consider microtransit options. Uh, so this could help uh, these mobility operators uh, running microtransit operations. 
Uh, we can also help federal agencies like the Federal Transit Administration uh, to identify uh, priority areas, uh, developing a national portfolio dashboard. And I could imagine uh, something similar can happen in Canada as well. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so that uh, pretty much concludes the, uh, the, uh, the work that we've been doing there. Uh, I did want to share some of the other on, uh, ongoing related research that we've, uh, we've been working in. Uh, one, one of the uh, very related topics uh, uh, to, to what I've just been showing you is, uh, is uh, the, the identification of uh, these other cities, right? So <clears throat> I mentioned that it's possible to potentially uh, cluster the cities into different typologies uh, so that now maybe we might uh, fit demand models and uh, the, um, the uh, uh, forecast models just for those, uh, each of those typologies. So that uh, when we select new cities, if we know which typology, which, uh, which classification they belong to, uh, we, can, uh, we can use the, uh, a better fitting uh, model. Uh, there has been work on identifying different uh, city typologies in the past, right? So one of the more recent ones uh, from MIT uh, looked at uh, six different um, uh, typologies, right? Uh, auto, bus transit, congested, metro, bike, mass transit, and hybrid. Uh, but they only had 331 cities data to test with. Uh, so what we uh, did with that was uh, we used natural language processing uh, to automate the extraction of data from Wikipedia. Uh, in fact, this is a uh, part of uh, Trusty's uh, dissertation work. Uh, so she's in the audience as well uh, to uh, expand the data set. So what we've been able to do uh, is using Wikipedia and uh, Sentencebird, uh, we can expand the, the set of cities uh, from 331 to over 2000 cities around the world. Right? So uh, with this, we, we have classifications of each of the cities uh, for each of those uh, typologies. So that's one study that we've been doing. Uh, related to microtransit is the, the idea of uh, mobility as a service and multimodal systems. So another research area that we've been working in is uh, looking at uh, route choice uh, under mobility as a service. Uh, the, the issue with uh, route choice in these kind of systems is that the delay uh, typically is really not within the links travel times. Uh, the delays that uh, travelers experience uh, is more uh, from the, the transfers uh, between one mode to another uh, and highly dependent on the fleet availability. Uh, so as an example, uh, if you think about uh, taking city, uh, well, I guess uh, um, uh, in uh, Toronto, you, you have uh, uh, that Big C, right? Uh, I, I don't know if it's still the same name. <laughs> Back when I was there, it was Big C. Uh, and so if you are considering taking a shared bike uh, service, uh, your decision of which station to walk to uh, depends on your perception of the availability of the bikes uh, that are there, right? Uh, so it's, uh, it's very dependent on the capacity, uh, but the capacity is actually congested in this case or congestible, right? Uh, they, they are a function of uh, both the demand patterns throughout the network, right? So if there's a lot of demand, uh, uh, a lot of influx into that uh, city, uh, it, uh, to that station, uh, that can lead to uh, a, a, a different impact. Uh, and, and also, it also depends on the operator's policy, right? So if uh, uh, an operator with one type of rebalancing policy versus another uh, can also impact that. Uh, and so we've been developing a modified stochastic user equilibrium model uh, in which uh, the, the, uh, we consider Q delay, uh, but the Q delay is not uh, linked directly to the travel cost, uh, but instead is linked to uh, a capacity effect uh, where the capacity effect is dependent on uh, the, uh, uh, the system, like a system of uh, uh, a flow uh, uh, interdependencies, right? So what it allows us to do is then uh, when we model uh, a, a network that uh, we assume to be a mobility as a service type of network or multimodal network in this case, uh, we are outputting not just the link flow, uh, but also uh, the dynamic capacities uh, or at least the steady state of the dynamic capacities. Uh, so that's one work that we're uh, working on right now. 
Uh, and then the, the last one that I'll, I'll uh, share with you uh, is looking at the question of how to conduct trip assignment on this kind of these kind of uh, mobility as a service networks uh, when they're owned by multiple operators. Right. So in in these settings, uh, you you are not just considering uh, the user's decisions of which route they want to choose, right? So that's the classic view, uh, the wardrobe's user equilibrium. Uh, what we need to consider instead is that uh, in this kind of uh, network, uh, operators have decisions as well. They can decide uh, which links to operate uh, and uh, how, how frequent of the service or uh, what kind of fleet size they want to use to accommodate that operation. Uh, and they will do so uh, so that it, it benefits them. So there needs to be an incentive consideration for both the operators and the travelers. Uh, and the way that we model this uh, is using uh, uh, cooperative game theory, uh, stable matching assignment games. Uh, we've been able to uh, illustrate uh, using these kind of methods, um, uh, different uh, resulting assignments where uh, the platform uh, can also uh, provide subsidies or has justification to provide subsidies, particularly in the case where the assignment might end up with a non-empty, uh, with an empty uh, stable outcome. So the subsidy would uh, perturb it to provide a, a stabilized uh, outcome. Uh, and, and, and so we've been studying this as well uh, to look at these um, multi-operator sites. All right, so that pretty much concludes the uh, uh, some of the research that we've been doing uh, and uh, I'll open it up for questions now. Uh.